Good morning, church. Glad to see everybody this morning. We're going to start off with a song and uh, uh, get right with it. Brandon, kick it off, and then we're going to go from there. We're going to sing a little victory in Jesus. Amen. We got victory in Jesus this morning. It's Easter. Yeah, all right? Amen. Let's give the God a hand clap of praise today, all right? That's all right. Stand to your feet this morning as we worship, all right? Stand to your feet. This morning, guys. How you feeling? Happy Easter. You can do better than that. Jesus is risen from the dead. You get the word? All right. Jesus rose from the dead. You get the word? Yeah. All right. Let's add a little drums to this uh, this morning. Everybody got something? church play I saw last night. John, thank you. Remember Jesus on the guitar. All right, guys, here we go. Let's praise the Lord this morning. I heard it all.
Give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Well, good morning. Good morning. You may be seated. Welcome to Riverside EMC Sunday morning worship service, Resurrection Sunday. We are glad you're here with us. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Let me be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 32. And it says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in any unworthy worthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. And nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with this world. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you on this Resurrection Sunday remembering your plan and thanking you. Thanking you, God, for everything that you've done for us. Lord, we thank you for the work done on the cross by Jesus Christ. What it means for us today, Lord, and what it means for us eternally. Father, would you take over this morning? Would you awaken those who are asleep? Father, would you have your way? We will be sure to praise you. Lord, we pray these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. church. Welcome to worship on this Resurrection Sunday. We're excited to celebrate our risen Savior today with you. If you're visiting with us today, we'd love to meet you and give you a gift. Just stop by the Welcome Center and see one of our team members. We have just a few announcements for you before we jump into service. Today is the last big push to raise money for the Kevin Butler Memorial Gym Remodel at Indian Cave Youth Camp. If you plan to give today or later, please designate your gift as Youth Camp Maintenance. Thank you for supporting our youth. Thank you to everyone involved in the Easter drama this year. We had a blast and hope you did too. Be sure to give a special thank you to Brian Gordon and Susan Minnie for spearheading this drama every year. Looking ahead to the next few weeks, be sure to join us for a new sermon series starting next week called Generations. We'll be looking at generations from the past and present in order to learn what God is revealing to us in Scripture. We'll kick off Sunday morning at 10 a.m. with our Sunday message and then join us Sunday evening at 6 p.m. for a concert with the Virginians Quartet. In addition to the message and music from the past, each week we'll be releasing a podcast on YouTube and other popular podcasting networks focused on diving deeper into the series. And who knows, we may even have guests on the show to share their generational experiences. We hope you'll join us each week in April for this new series. And other news, if you're newer to Riverside and haven't quite found where you fit in, or maybe you just want to learn more about the church and its history, then we encourage you to sign up for Discover Riverside. This is an informal lunch after next week's service on April 7th. The aim of Discover Riverside is to give you information and answer any questions you may have about the church. There will be time to talk, meet with the pastors and staff, 
as well as share a meal together, of course. For more information about what's happening at Riverside, visit our welcome center. That's all of our announcements for this week. I'm Seth. And I'm Layla. See, See you, you next, next time. crowd this morning. Lots of prayers, please. <laughs> Try to keep myself from being so nervous. Thank you, Vicki. I appreciate that so much. Good morning again. Good morning. It is good to see each and every one of you here this morning. I hope you're glad to be here. I know the video announcement said it, but I'll just say it again. If you are visiting with us today, we are especially glad that you are here. We have a gift for you out in our welcome center. If you want to join us out or jo find um, Seth, raise your hand. Uh, he's the big guy back in the sound booth with the beard. And uh, 
Um, you can uh, find him back in the Welcome Center. By the way, if you don't know me, you may not, even if you're here every Sunday, you may not know me today. <laughs> I'm Brian Gordon. I'm the pastor here. I usually have a beard, but uh, shaved it last night, which my wife is not happy about. Uh, as part of the Easter drama, but anyway, that's another story. Um, by the way, um, if you were involved in the Easter drama in any way, stand if you would. Yeah, give him a big hand. Thank you. We had over 800 that came out to see the play over the three nights, and so praise the Lord for that great time together, and uh, we raised uh, a little under $3,000 for the Salem Food Pantry. So that's, a, that's another story. Right. Anyway, back to visitors. We don't call you out here if you're visiting, but what we will, would love for you to do is, is find Seth at the Welcome Center, and he has a gift that he would like to give you this morning. So if you'll find him um, he'll get that gift for you. And uh, on your way out today, there are boxes on your left and your right as you go out the door. Uh, we'd love to know that you were here. So sign your tenant's registration, tear that out, and throw that in the offering plate. Uh, and those offering boxes, those offering boxes, if you're part of the church, you know what that's for. If you're just visiting with us today, the only thing we expect you to throw in there, if you would, is just that attendance registration. So we would just love to know that you are here. All right. Well, um, we're getting ready to do the thing that some people love and some people don't love. And so if you love it, this is for you. If you don't love it, this is the time for you to take a little restroom break if you want to. But I'm going to invite you to stand. And if you would like to greet your neighbor to your left and to your right, take just a minute to do that. And here in just a minute, we're going to sing to the Lord.
Get y'all settled down here a little bit. We're going to stay here in a minute. We got a little uh, technical difficulty back here. John's, one of John's uh, equipment had a failure back here, so we're trying to give him a little time to get it, get it straightened out. He's supposed to just lay hands on it, right? I know. Jesus should be able just to touch it and heal it. But, right. Uh, I, I will, uh, at this time, though, man, it would be great to have a crowd like this next Sunday morning, so don't y'all... You know, call out and say, okay, uh, uh, Easter Sunday is good, but, uh, you know, we'd love to have you back next Sunday morning. And then next Sunday night, like I say, the Virginian Quartet's going to be here. When Brian first said something about it, he said, uh, you know, it'd be good if we could have a, a group come and sing. You know, he asked about my group back in call, and I said, well, you know, if you're talking about the silent generation, which he was talking about, I said, how about I get the old guys to come here and sing the Virginian Quartet? Uh, which I still sing with and, and uh, we practice every, about every week. But uh, so if you like good quartet music, come back next Sunday night and uh, it, it'll, be, uh, it'll be a thrill for you, I believe. Uh, so, all right, John, you about got it? Yeah. Okay, you're good enough for us to start. All right. Well, we don't want to leave you wandering in the night like this song is talking about. <laughs> But we thank God every day for what he's given to us and how he turns us around and gets us straightened out. And uh, I'm just thankful that I gave my heart and life to him years ago. And he's uh, served me so well. So let's sing about it. I thank God. Here, church.
many things to be thankful for this morning. And um, yesterday I was at a funeral and the pastor said, I want to share with you these three messages of hope. And he said, one, God is God and he's good. Two, God cares. And three, God is life. And this morning I am so thankful for his resurrection power that he is life. And because he is life and because he rose from the grave, we have life. And I'm so thankful for that this morning. So just remember, God is God and he's good. God cares and God is life. Let's sing this morning.
Let's just do that and lift our voices off the pillow this morning. Your name is Victory. Is this name Victory this morning? It's the definition of victory this morning. Hallelujah. Let's sing. Your name. Your name. Your name. question I expect. Don't get the excitement. I will ask it again, just so you know. Is anyone in here feeling joy? If you are, say amen. amen. Oh, that was awesome. Great job. You've probably heard people talk about the happiness. They are different things. I can be happy because I just had my cup of coffee. It's after four cups of coffee in the morning, but it still makes me happy. I have joy. Thank you. Thank you. Not today, Satan. <laughs> That's right. Not stopping me. I have joy when I think about where we are today, when I think about our resurrected Lord. Joy is something you feel down deep inside, and no amount of unhappiness is going to rob me from my joy. Because I know what today is. I know that this is Sunday. On Friday, we saw this in, in the drama, but on Friday, those who were followers of Christ, I will tell you, they did not feel joy on Friday. They felt despair. They felt despair on Saturday. They, they didn't know what was happening on Sunday. They, they probably should have known, but they, they, their faith was wavering a little bit. They did not know. But then Sunday came and despair started to turn back to joy. But guess what? We don't have to go back to what they experienced that Friday and Saturday. We have joy always now because of our resurrected Lord. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna be unhappy at times, absolutely. That's life. We are human. We will experience true, true moments of feeling that unhappiness and, and even, yes, despair, it happens. But we have the knowledge and the faith of knowing that we have a reason to be joyful. Amen. So even in your despair, even in your unhappiness, get down on your knees and feel that joy because it is real and it is present and it is here. Please join us as we sing.
can cut these monitors up here in the front if you want to. That would be wonderful. All right. All right. I want to take um, some time to spend before the Lord in prayer. I think we're still on with this floor monitor here. If we can, something, something's a little crazy up here. I want to take uh, just a few minutes to spend before the Lord in prayer uh, this morning. And, uh, Again, thank you for being here on this Resurrection Sunday. Uh, today, is we're also going to be celebrating communion. Everyone is welcome to join us at the communion table. You do not have to be a member of the church. The only thing that we ask is that you be a born-again believer, washed in the blood of the Lamb. And if you identify as a follower of Christ, then you are welcome to join us this morning at the Lord's Supper. But I want to take just a few minutes to pray before we dive into the message that the Lord has laid on my heart this morning. And uh, I only have an hour and a half message prepared, so um, we'll be out of here. I'm just kidding, not that long. I, um, I never preach that long, just an hour at most. Not even that long, I'm kidding. Some of you guys who are here for the first time, you're like, who invited us to come to church today? Before we pray, I do want to invite you to come back next week. Um, we are starting a brand new series. Mark mentioned it just a little bit. Next Sunday morning uh, and through the month of April, we're going to be in a series called Generations. And in that generation series, what we're going to be doing is celebrating all the generations who have lived starting, we're going to start in 1925 to today. So we're going to start with the silent generation, talking about the silent generation, those born between 1925 and 1945. Then we're going to talk about the baby boomer generation. Then we're going to talk about Gen Xers. Go Gen X. Then we're going to talk about millennials. And then we're going to talk about um, Gen Z. And uh, so I'm excited. It's going to be a fun series. And here's what we're going to do. All the music that we're going to sing every Sunday morning is going to be from that generation. So all the songs we're going to be singing next Sunday morning are going to be, everybody that's part of the silent generation, you're like, yes! Next Sunday morning, we're going to be singing all old hymns, and then Sunday night, you can come back, and the Virginians Quartet's going to be here and uh, share with us. And then, so the next Sunday, we'll pick songs from the baby boomer generation, the Jesus movement uh, music, and uh, that's when the vineyard movement started. So a lot of those songs... Uh, came out of that movement. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I hope that you'll come and join us. We're also going to be doing some special events through the month of April. We're still kind of figuring out what all those are going to be. But I hope that you'll come and join us. It's going to be a really fun series uh, together as we talk about what, what we can learn from each generation because there's something that we can learn from each generation. In fact, the Bible says this, one generation commends your works to another. And there's something to celebrate in every generation. So that's what we're going to be doing. All right. That said, we're going to take some time to pray. Mike, you wanted to be anointed this morning, right? Uh, Mike, if you'll come, uh, we're going to anoint Mike. Uh, Mike wants to be anointed. Maybe we're going to anoint you this morning. I had some anointing oil. It has disappeared. On the front table, somewhere under the cloth. If you want to very gently see if you can find it. Here it is. I found it. I found it. All is rescued. All is saved. All right. Um, if someone to come and gather around Mike, we're going to pray over him. Mike was to be anointed for Jack McDaniel, who uh, uh, we have prayed over Jack. We prayed for Jack. Um, he's had a host of issues over these last months and actually saw him at uh, uh, Chip and Joe's uh, last week, I think, week before. And uh, he's just he's having a rough time. But we're going to pray and just trust God for God's continued anointing over Jack and his family and maybe you have a need this morning and uh, we're just gonna I'm just gonna invite you just maybe if you got a need this morning just lift your hand to the Lord I'm not gonna call you out don't worry I'm not gonna make you stand up God knows your need he knows exactly what it is just lift it to him uh, we do have some good news Jim O'Quinn went home on Friday praise the Lord he's not able to be here today but he is at home in his own bed which makes him a happy camper so we praise the Lord for that all right Mike, I anoint you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And Lord, I am thankful for the promises of your word that you will never leave us nor forsake us. The promise of your word that if we ask anything in your name, it will be given to us. And Lord, that's a scary scripture when we, when we quote it because, um, Lord, we know that things don't always happen according to our will. And the, the reality is sometimes when we pray, we ask in our will, we ask what we want. And sometimes what we want is not what you know is best for us. And, and yet I'm reminded of what Beth said this morning that she heard in the message yesterday, that you are good in every circumstance. Lord, we know that you are good in Jack's circumstance. We don't know why he's going through all the difficulties he's going through. We don't know why things are piled up on him. But Lord, we know that you know exactly what you are doing. And so, Lord, we just lay Jack in your hands today, and we ask that you touch him. Lord, that we are praying and believing for complete healing. Lord, we pray that you would grant that to him. We're asking in your name, and we're trusting that you are able. God, you know all of our needs this morning. You know what brings us to church this morning. You know if we're, whether we're here because our spouse begged us. You know whether we're here because our parents dragged us out of bed this morning and said, you're going to church. I don't care whether you want to go or not. Uh, maybe we're here because we woke up this morning and it's Resurrection Sunday and we could not wait to be in God's house because we want to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Maybe today we're here because we're questioning. You know, we, we, we think we love Jesus and we think we know about Him and we, we believe that He rose from the dead, but we're not sure about all these other things that the Bible says. And so God... I pray this morning that your Holy Spirit would just blow through this place and you would reveal the truth to our hearts. Lord, you know all of our needs. You saw every uplifted hand this morning. God, I pray that in every situation, you would be sovereign over every situation. Move and work according to your will, which is always for our good. Because you are working all things to the good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So God, have your way. We'll thank you and we'll praise you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate that. All right. Well, if you have your Bible, turn to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 24. We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 8, and then we're going to skip over to verses 36 and read through verse 49. While you're turning there, let me ask you a question. Anybody here a superhero fan? Okay, a few of you. There are a few nerds like me, all right. Well, when I was a kid, I grew up, I'm a Gen Xer. Uh, I grew up in the early 80s and into the 90s and in the early 80s and into the, really mostly in the 80s, Christopher Reeves' Superman. He was the, you didn't think about Avengers, you thought Christopher Reeve, Superman. Now, not every one of those movies was great, but the first couple were awesome. But I loved Christopher Reeve, Superman. I also grew up at that same time, what was popular on TV was the Lou Ferrigno Incredible Hulk television series. And I loved the Incredible Hulk. In fact, there's a... Um, I've, I think I've shared this story one time. We were um, sitting at home watching The Incredible Hulk, and uh, my dad was sitting behind me in an easy chair, and he was kind of leaning back, had his feet up, and it went to commercial, and I turned around and went Hulk and grabbed the footrest and flipped my dad over. Um, I was uh, maybe five years old. I remember it as clear as a bell because I remember him going straight over, feet straight up in the air, and I thought, if I start crying, I won't be in trouble. But he laughed, he thought it was funny. But here's what I most remember. When I was five or six years old, I got the two greatest things a five or six year old superhero fan could ever get. I got Superman pajamas that came with a cape. And someone gave me a light gray three-piece suit to wear for Easter. It was awesome. So that Easter Sunday, our family went to church with my grandma down the road at Bethel Baptist Church, and there I was with my three-piece suit on, 
and underneath my three-piece suit were my Superman pajamas. Now, I begged my mom and dad to let me wear my red galoshes that Sunday as well because I wanted to be able to Superman out. You know what Superman out is, right? It's when you go running and you pull your shirt open and you become Superman. Now, I don't know how many shirts I ruined running through the house, ripping off my shirt to become Superman over the next uh, few weeks, but I'm sure it was more than one. But here's the interesting thing. From as far back in recorded history as we can go, the story of the hero has been a common theme. In every culture, in every time, no matter where it is around the world, they were looking for a superhero. There are stories of superheroes in every culture. Often, common men or women who stepped out of their ordinary lives answered and answered the call to do great things. The Bible itself is full of accounts of heroes. Ordinary men and women who, with God's help, stepped up to do great things. Abraham answering God's call to become the father of a great nation, even though he and his wife were both old and past the the age of being able to have kids. Moses, delivering God's people. David, defeating Goliath. Samson, defeating a thousand Philistines with an ox jaw. Gideon, going to war against the Midianites. You can, you can go on and on through the Bible, and there are lots of heroes that step up. But all of these stories, and even the myths that we find outside the Bible, point to two things. Number one, humanity has an inherent need to be rescued. There is something in us that tells us we need to be rescued. We know that we need to be rescued from something, the reality is we often have no idea what it is we need to be rescued from. We just know that we need to be rescued. And we've known that from the beginning. We know that we need to be saved and we cannot save ourselves. The other thing these stories teach us is that our inherent understanding, that we have had an inherent understanding that a true hero would one day come. That's, that's what all these myths outside of the Bible and then all these true accounts in the Bible are teaching us. Number one, that we knew we needed a, a, a hero, but also that we knew that one would come, that we are looking for the hero who could come and save the day. The Bible tells us who that hero is and how he came to save us. So let's look uh, Luke chapter 24. We're going to begin reading in verse 1, read through verse 12, and then skip over to verse 36. Here's what it says. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. Now, little side note right here. I want you to notice something. On the first day of the week, who is it that comes to the tomb? The women. Where are the men? They're chickens. So if you ever want to say, if you ever want to macho yourself up, just remember it was the women who were bold enough to be there with Jesus at the end. And it was the women, other than John, the youngest of the disciples, and it was the women who were bold enough to go to the tomb where the Roman soldiers were and anoint the body. 
Like, they did it without the power of the Holy Spirit. You know the only way the disciples became apostles? The men? They had to get filled with the Holy Spirit to do it. Now, the women got filled with the Spirit too. But, but the point is, don't discount what a, what a woman can do for the Lord. Anyway, that's a side note. I gave you that for free. Now, next part. <laughs> Verse 11, but they did not believe the women. This is the men when they go tell the apostles, of course. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what happened. Now, the next part is Jesus appears to two of, the, uh, two of his followers walking on the road to Emmaus. He, um, they don't know who he is. He walks with them for a while. He actually goes in and eats with them. They finally figure out who it is. Now we're going to get to verse 36. Remember, the disciples, when the women came and said the tomb was empty, they did not quite get it that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Here we are in verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and feet. It is I myself. And I love this phrase. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. While they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. Why is he doing it? Well, maybe he was hungry. But the reality is he's saying, look, I am flesh and blood. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. Uh, Verse 44. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Now, thinking about Jesus as the hero of our story, I want to just point out a a couple of things to you this morning. Number one, Jesus was a real, true, historical hero. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning. I know most people that are here this morning, you're saying, well, duh, Uh, that's why I'm in church. I believe that there was a real true historical guy named Jesus. But I'm going to tell you, if you pull any, any um, magazine off the newsstands at Easter time that's talking about Jesus, the first thing they're going to try to do is say, well, let's get past all the nonsense and let's figure out who the real guy was. And here's what we know. Almost all scholars, even those who don't ascribe supernatural characteristics to Jesus, agree that Jesus was a real person who lived in the first century. Almost all scholars agree that Jesus was a teacher who attracted a large following. Almost all scholars also agree that Jesus' teachings got him in trouble with the Jewish leadership and or the Roman authorities, and he was put to death as a result. Most also agree that his manner of death was was crucifixion. Now, this is where there's a huge divide. Because most scholars, not most scholars, many scholars end it right there. And when I say scholars, sometimes you can scholar yourself out of faith. Um, But that's where some scholars quit. They say, well, he was a real guy. He really lived. Um, He walked the earth and he died because he got in trouble with the Romans and the the Jewish leaders. And they crucified him and that's it. But the question is, what does the evidence say? Was Jesus really who he said he was, and did he actually rise from the dead? Now here's what the the evidence says. The earliest witnesses, the women who found the empty tomb, and the disciples certainly believed that the Jesus that they followed rose from the dead. 
How do we know that? Because they all, with the exception of one, died for what they believed in. They found themselves very shortly after the resurrection, 50 days after the resurrection to be precise, standing in Jerusalem, filled with the Holy Spirit, preaching that Jesus physically died and physically walked out of the tomb. And they, they preached that, and they got in trouble for that, and 11 of the 12 died for that. Only one of them lived to old age, John, and the one who lived to old age was horribly persecuted throughout his whole life and for most of his latter years was exiled on the Isle of Patmos for it. Um, not a very nice place to live. It's rugged. It's barren. There's not a lot there. There's not a lot to eat. So it wasn't like an, an island vacation. Uh, it was basically a prison. Not only did they testify to his resurrection, but they also testified to his identity as the Son of God. And they proclaimed it loudly. All the earliest witnesses and the earliest written account of the resurrection all testify that more than 400 people saw Jesus alive after he was crucified on the cross. And so the resurrection of Jesus is a historical event. The resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day after his crucifixion is a historical event. It's not just a story. It's not just a hope that we have. It's not a myth that's intended to be a morality tale. It is a true historical event factual event that happened in place in time in fact the life death and resurrection of jesus was part of a plan prophesied by god through his chosen people there are more than 300 prophecies in the old testament that point to the life death and resurrection of jesus christ most of those prophecies written more than 400 years before jesus was born. One of those accounts, Isaiah 53, was written nearly 700 years before Jesus was born. And Isaiah 53 recounts in precise detail the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus and says that he would become the lamb slain for our sins, that by his stripes we were healed. I want to say to you this morning that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the pivotal event in history. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Corinthians says that if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we have no hope and we are still dead in our trespasses and sins. If there were no physical resurrection of Jesus from the dead, then you and I have no reason to be here this morning. In fact, here's what I would so boldly pro proclaim. If Jesus did, in, did not, in fact, historically rise from the dead, we might as well stop coming to church. There is no reason for us to get together. We could go join a club, and we would get just as much out of it. But there is a reason why we gather together. There's a reason why we love each other. There's a reason why we gather as God's people and we eat his flesh and drink his blood. And it's because we believe that he physically died and he physically rose from the dead. And that leads to the second thing that I want to point out to you this morning. And it's that Jesus' truly historic, heroic act his truly heroic act was his physical death and his physical resurrection. The gospel narratives go to great lengths to, to describe the agony and death of Jesus. His physical death. How he was arrested and taken before Caiaphas where he is spit upon, mocked, and beaten. After being mocked and mistreated by Herod, he is sent to Pilate. 
There he's beaten and whipped by Roman soldiers who mock him by fashioning a crown of thorns. Each of those thorns as much as two inches long and as sharp as a needle. They take that crown of thorns, they press it on his head, and then beat him over the head with a rod. Beaten and bloodied, Pilate parades him before the people who, influenced by the Jews, demand that he be crucified. Jesus is then forced to carry his own cross for as long as he is able to anyway. The almost half mile from the Roman Praetorium to Golgotha through narrow winding streets. There nails are driven through his hands and his feet. and For six hours he endures the agony of of slowly suffocating to death as his muscles succumb to the strain of the weight of carrying his own body, holding his own body on the weight of nails. He slowly begins to lose his strength, and as he loses his strength, his lungs begin to constrict, and as his lungs begin to constrict, it is more and more difficult for him to breathe. That's why it is amazing when we read the scriptures that there are seven, seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. He is able to gather the strength to say seven things that are important to us that I don't have time to go into this morning. At 3 p.m., Jesus breathes his last breath and he dies. And just to be sure that he is dead, the soldiers thrust a spear into his side, piercing both his lung and his heart. How do we know that? Because the scriptures say that when the spear pierces his side, water and blood run out. On the cross, God the Son died. But he didn't stay dead. Jesus physically rose from the dead. In other words, the Jesus that came out of the tomb was not a ghost with his physical body still lying somewhere. They're not going to find the body of Jesus anywhere. There's not going to be some archaeological dig someday that's going to find a box with bones that say the body of Jesus because his body was not there. He physically rose from the dead and he physically walked out of the tomb. And when he walked out of that tomb, he declared victory over sin and death forever. When the angels appear to the women, they testify to his physical resurrection. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, for he is risen. In verses 13 through 35, he physically walks with two of his followers on the road to Emmaus. Then he goes in the house with them and he physically eats with them. In verses 36 through 49, when he appears to the disciples at first, they think he's a ghost. But what does Jesus say? He says, touch and see. I'm not a ghost. I'm a physical person. I have physically risen from the dead. Now, why does that matter? Why does the physical death and physical resurrection of Jesus matter? Maybe you could get the history part, okay? Maybe at least the disciples believed it. But why does it matter whether Jesus physically rose from the dead? Can't we still find meaning in the Easter story, even if it didn't really happen? Can't we find meaning in the idea of resurrection, even if it really didn't happen? This is why it matters. The physical resurrection of Jesus validates every claim that he ever made. You see, if Jesus did not physically rise from the dead, then he was a liar. And it doesn't matter what any other good thing he said was. Let me, let me ask you a question. Let's say Jeff and I are on the golf course and and I played straight up all day. I, you know, I didn't roll my ball. <laughs> That's not ever, never going to happen. But let's say I didn't roll my ball. You know, if I hit the ball in the woods, I, I hit another ball from the tee box. And, you know, I followed all the rules. But we get on the last hole and Jeff and I are tied. And I hit the ball in the woods. 
And Jeff watches me walk to the edge of the woods. And he knows I've been on this all day. But I walk to the edge of the woods and he sees me reach in my pocket. And I pull out a ball. And I drop that ball. And I hit that ball and we get up to the, the green and I putt and I beat Jeff by one stroke. Let me ask you a question. Is Jeff going to say, you know, Brian's mostly honest, so he's okay. Is that what Jeff is going to say? Jeff's going to say, you are a liar. Why? Because you can say a lot of good stuff, but one lie ruins it all. And that's the reality. Jesus could have said a whole lot of good stuff. But if he lied about who he thought he was, or he was mistaken about who he thought he was, or if he said to the disciples, or even to the Jewish religious leaders, if he said, you tear down this temple and I will rebuild it in three days, but he did not do that, it doesn't matter what else he said. He's a liar. His resurrection validates his authority as the Savior of the world. His resurrection fulfills prophecy and it seals his victory over sin and death forever. His resurrection guarantees our deliverance from sin and confirms the promise of our own bodily resurrection as well. If Christ were not raised, then we are still dead in our trespasses and sins, and we are no better off than we were before. If Christ were not raised, then we have no hope. But as Paul says in Corinthians, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. On this Easter Sunday, we're going to participate here in just a few moments in one of the sacraments instituted by Christ himself, communion. While we do that, the praise team is going to sing. Today we gather to celebrate the risen Christ. But we remember that before he could rise, he had to die. This morning... We invite you to participate with us and remember. But it's more than a remembrance. In the communion meal, Christ is present with us in a real, tangible way. And so we approach the table with reverence. That's the first scripture that, that Jeff read this morning. When we approach the table, we come with reverence and thanksgiving and awe because it is a time in the church. You know, we have the Holy Spirit with us all the time. We don't always have the presence of Jesus. We always have the presence of the Spirit. Now, yes, God is, Jesus is God, God is, the Father is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. But in the communion meal, we have the promise in Scripture that Jesus will be with us, the second person of the Trinity, in a real way. And so today we come and we commune with him, offering ourselves as a living sacrifice, dying to ourselves so that we might live for him. And so this morning, as you as actually it's going to be brought to you, I'm going to ask you to give thanks for his body broken for you. And as you drink, give Jesus thanks for the blood that makes eternal life possible. So the praise team's going to come, and as they come, we're going to uncover the table, and then I'm going to pray. Our ushers are going to come, and they're going to begin uh, the process of handing out the bread and the juice. If you will, um, wait until everybody gets it, and then we're going to eat and drink together this morning. And if our guys, I think Don has recruited our guys who are going to help us this morning. If you can go ahead and come forward at this time. Let me pray over these elements. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today on this Resurrection Sunday thankful that today we are part of history. The greatest, not just story, but the greatest event in the history of the world. The resurrection of our Lord. Today we celebrate your resurrection 
but we also remember your death. And we invite you, Jesus, to commune with us as we commune with you. Lord, this bread and this juice, this bread which represents your body, this juice which represents your blood, would you sanctify these elements? And as we take, Lord, would we take and eat and participate in your death? And as we drink, Lord, may we be reminded that we are partakers of a new covenant written in your blood, a covenant of salvation, salvation from sin and resurrection to eternal glory. Thank you, Jesus. We pray, amen.
waiting for everyone to get served. We uh, are also uh, filling some more juice. We might run out of juice before we get to the back, but we promise we are going to let you get served. So we're not going to let you get out of here without getting to participate this morning. Let's go back and just sing that third verse and uh, the chorus again. it's a good problem when it takes a while, right? Because there's a lot of people to serve. I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stand. Those who've been served, go ahead and stand with me. If you haven't been served, you can wait. Are we going to run out of juice or are we okay? Do we think we're good? All right. Y'all can go tell Lori not to panic because uh, I sent her on a panic back there. Team. We want to get the praise team. <laughs> Seth, if you could uh, send somebody up here with, for the praise team. We've got a healthy coming. All right. Thank you. he was arrested just before he left for the agony in the garden Jesus took the bread at the meal and he broke it he said take and eat in remembrance of me so take now and eat in remembrance that Jesus died for you took the cup and he blessed it he said this is the blood of the new covenant take now and drink in remembrance that Jesus shed his blood for you
God, today we participate in Holy Communion, where we practice the presence of Jesus. And Lord, I don't know what all that means. It's somewhat of a mystery to me exactly how Jesus is present with us in this communion meal. And we know that your word makes it clear that you are with us here today. Thank you for your presence. We thank you for the, the abiding Holy Spirit who you've given us, who indwells us daily and empowers us to serve you. Lord, may we, your resurrected ones, resurrected from our sins, looking for eventual resurrection glory, may we live lives that are a reflection of the Jesus that we serve. May we grasp the fullness of what it means to live and to walk with you. God, I thank you for each person gathered here today. Every person in this room is valuable to you. You have a plan and a purpose for every single person in this room. And it begins with their surrender to Jesus. And then you promise to do great things in us and through us. And so God, have your way. God, as we leave here this morning, on this resurrection day, would you go with us? Would you guide us? Would you direct us? And God, would you keep us safe until we come again? And Lord, we'll thank you and we'll praise you. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. If you're visiting with us, see Seth back in the Welcome Center. He'd love to give you a gift today. See you soon. Ha, ha, ha.